Guys, seriously. Hey, I need you to pay attention because today is my favorite day of the year. It's Moby Dick Day. Oh. Okay, this is the most exciting. Hi, people who couldn't be here. We are being recorded, so FYI, I'll let you know that um, because a lot of people are absent today. Um, but the reason I get so excited about this, and I just want to be very clear, today is all about me. Not you, because it's your birthday. It's all about me. Because this is... No, I just said it was all about me. <laughs> Happy birthday, Jeffrey. You're in the video. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. All right, um, but the reason uh, I get excited is this my favorite chapter from my favorite book um, that I think is the best uh, representation of American literature, and um, so I'm excited about it for that. Today I'm going to ask you to pretend to be excited and enthusiastic, even if you're not. Not only will that make me happy, but it will help you along in the process of what we're doing. So today we're going to learn how to ask good questions. And here's the hard part. We're going to have to hold off on doing analysis until the very end. And so if you start saying something and you are doing analysis rather than asking a question, I'm going to ask you to reframe it as a question. And the reason is, is there's a lot going on in here, and we I want to just identify all the areas for analysis. So our no is the definitions and typical uses of literary and rhetorical tropes. Okay, we should know that stuff at this point. Maybe not all of them perfectly, but we should know most of them. Our understand should be rhetorical literary tropes help authors develop setting, characterization, plot, and theme. And that's what we're going to be exploring today, so that eventually you can do using these effectively in your writing and, of course, doing the analysis as well. So what we're going to do today is we're going to read one chapter called The Line from Moby Dick. Uh, it's about um, maybe 100 pages into Moby Dick. Uh, so it's been going on for a while. And the setting is, is that a, a narrator named Ishmael, the very famous line, call me Ishmael, beginning of Moby Dick, is narrating the story of his experience on a whaling boat with Captain Ahab, a guy who is crazy because he wants, and that's our Captain Ahab right there, because he wants to find this white whale he's named Moby Dick because it took his leg and he's really mad at it. Okay, so he's walking around on his peg leg and it's all Moby Dick's fault and he is maniacally pursuing this white whale. Um, it becomes a symbol of everything for him and these guys are along for the ride. Now they're whaling in general because back in the time period they used that as energy. Uh, it was a massive way to make a lot of money. If you could catch a, one good whale, you could be set for a really long time. It was a very dangerous job, but it was a job that you could make a lot of money on with a fairly limited skill set. So what's happening is we've been building it, we've seen the white whale, we're excited, we're going, then all of a sudden this chapter hits about rope. It's called the line. And a lot of people get frustrated and they stop for reasons you're about to see, okay? Because they're like, wait, I thought we were going after the whale. But there's a lot of meaning in here. And so we're going to make one assumption today, which is that everything that Melville did in here, he did on purpose, okay? That he did it for a reason, okay? And then, again, we're going to just try and really focus in on the figurative thing. So anytime something is literally not true, you're going to try and mark that and identify it, okay? So that's why our pencils and pens are out. I'm going to read it. We're going to stop. We're going to consider. And I want you making observations. What do you see that he's doing in terms of schemes and tropes, okay? And then all we're going to do is do that until we get to the end. All right? So, with reference to the whaling scene shortly to be described, as well as for the better understanding of all similar scenes elsewhere presented, I have here to speak of the magical, sometimes horrible, whale line. Go through that real quick and mark up anything that stands out to you. What is anything that you see that might be significant? Okay, I know that's, you could keep going, that's, that's the joy of Herman Melville, but tell me some things that you observed that seems like they might be significant to you. Um, he uses both views, like he says it's 
magical, but then it's horrible? Yeah. The idea of magical, and what are the connotations of the word magical? If you say something had a magical, it was a magical experience. It was crazy. It means good. It doesn't mean like necromancy, uh, you know, or dark magic. It means a positive thing. So what's our term for when we say magical, how something is somehow magical and horrible at the same time? Anaphora. Paradox. Paradox. Okay. Anaphora is the repeated things at the beginning of the sentences. A is for at the beginning. Okay? Yes? Also that thing that like you're saying something positive, but then you put a comment in and you describe it in a negative way. Well, that's what paradox, you're getting at the sentiment of the paradox. Antithesis has to be sentence structure, right? Because parallelism is when you have the longer sentence structure, and antithesis is when you use it to contrast. And so, but you're getting at exactly the sentiment that paradox is, which is you seem like you would be going one way with it, and then you go another. What's our other device? What's another term that does that, where you have an expectation, and that expectation is defied? Which type of irony? Situational. situational irony okay so your good questions could be why his use of paradox or why his use of situational irony if you can't find the terms that's okay but that's going to help you kind of focus in there okay uh, also uh, that's a one sentence paragraph right so one question might be why a one sentence introductory paragraph okay all right next paragraph again still looking and annotating for things that we see the line originally used in the fishery was of the best hemp slightly vapored with tar, not impregnated with it, as in the case of ordinary ropes. For while tar, as ordinarily used, makes the hemp more pliable to the rope maker and also renders the rope itself more convenient to the sailor for common ship use. Yet, not only would the ordinary quantity too much stiffen the whale line for the co close coiling to which it must be subjected, but as most seamen are beginning to learn, uh, tar in general by no means adds to the rope's durability or strength, however much it may give its compactness and gloss. Riveting stuff, I know. Let's identify anywhere. You can always start, what's something that's figurative? What's something that stands out to you? What's something that seems like this is an interesting uh, detail he chose to include? Into questions. Is tar being described as bringing trade? <laughs> okay. And and that again is defying maybe our expectations of tar, right? Okay. What are some other things that we see in there that might be something we could talk about? We're not going to talk about it yet, but some questions we might have. He's comparing things. What things is he comparing? Uh, this six nine. Slightly vapor the tar, not impregnated. Um, it says renders the rope more convenient. Uh, then it's third time. It adds to. It doesn't add to the durability of strength, but it may give it compactness. Like it keeps getting pros and cons. Okay, so why the extended comparison? Maybe. Okay. Yeah. I was like, he doesn't like ordinary rope. Like he's like almost only a reference. You're doing analysis. Give me a question where you might be getting that idea from, though. What are you observing in there that gives you that idea of reverence? Why doesn't he like ordinary? Okay. So, well, but doesn't he give that explanation? Yeah. Okay. So our use would maybe be why the word, use of the word ordinary? Doesn't ordinary have fairly negative. negative connotations? It's pedestrian. It's kind of blasé or whatever. So, you know, why does he describe it? as ordinary. And you may find out later, well, he was just doing that because that was the most common rope or something like that, but it's still okay to ask questions as you go. All right, any other things that stand out to you? Well, let me ask you a question. Uh, is it literally true for a rope to be impregnated with tar? Mm -hmm. it, yeah, it can't be. It's personification, okay? It's a rope. It can be filled with it. It can be imbued with it, but it can't be impregnated with it. So we do have personification. Okay, so one thing that you can always look at are his diction choices. Why did he choose this word instead of another word? 
And it's especially easy to do with big words. And some of you may be going, well, because you wanted to sound smart. Okay, we're going to say that that's a possibility, but we're still not going to let that get in the way of our potential analysis. Okay? All right. Also, how many sentences is uh, paragraph two? One. one sentence. Okay? That's a lot of sentiment for one sentence. All right. Next paragraph. Of um, late years, the manila rope has in the American fishery Sorry. Of late years, the manila rope has in the American fishery almost entirely superseded hemp as a material for whale lines. For though not so durable as hemp, it is stronger and far more soft and elastic. And I will add, since there is an aesthetic in all things, is much more handsome and becoming to the boat than hemp. Hemp is a dusky dark fellow, a sort of Indian, but manila is a golden-haired Circassian to behold. It's getting a little interesting now. Right? Yeah. Can these two be up these questions? Should it be why questions? They can be. They just need to be questions, and you don't want them to be too leading. So, like, you don't want to be... Well, here, let me, I'll, do, I'll tell you this. If I hear an example that's too leading, I'll try and give you an example of it. Because if I give you one, then I'm going to be leading your analysis. And that's what we're trying to stay away from. Okay? So tell me what stands out to you. What are questions that you would have and you would ask? Well, it's not a question, but he uses, like, handsome. He describes the rope, which, I mean, could be personification. So why the use, why the, again, use of personification? That's a good question. Yeah. Why the metaphor at the end, like, Yeah, why the comparison of uh, one to the Indian and the other to a golden-haired Circassian, which I think was like an old Germanic tribe or something, kind of like an Aryan tribe. Because that automatically, we want to go there right away and start talking about the racial implications, but we're not going to yet, right? But we, are, we can sit there and say, why does he make this comparison? And then you can even ask, why the allusion to the Circassians? And of course, if you were going to analyze it, you'd have to go look them up. Other things that you see in here, notice that he does questions you would ask. Why does he care what the rope is doing? Okay. Why does this matter? I think it's a valid question. What's it? Look, just look at it. There's one thing that stands out that's different. You don't even have to read the words. Yeah. Well, he has like, yeah, ellipses or whatever. Yeah. So why the use of the parenthesis? Okay, that's the literary device. Parentheses is the example. So why his use of parenthesis? Okay. Why does he feel the need to interrupt that sentence with that information? All right, next paragraph. The whale line is only two-thirds of an inch in thickness. At first sight, you would not think it's so strong as it really is. By experiment, it's 1 in 50 yarns will each suspend a weight of 120 pounds, so that the whole rope will bear a strain nearly equal to 3 tons. In length, the common sperm whale line measures something over 200 fathoms. Towards the stern of the boat, it is spirally coiled away in the tub, not like the worm pipe of a still, though, but so as to form one round, cheese-shaped mass of densely bedded sheaves, or layers of concentric spiralizations, without any hollow but the heart, or minute vertical tube formed at the axis of the cheese. As the least tangle or kink in the coiling would, in running out, infallibly take somebody's arm, leg, or entire body off, the utmost precaution is used in stowing the line in its tub. Some harpooners will consume almost an entire morning in this business, carrying the line high aloft and then reaving it downwards through a block toward the tub, so as in the act of coiling to free it from all possible wrinkles and twists. So, fun. Write at least a question mark on that sheet somewhere. Yeah. We have so many questions about this. <coughs> Why? What does it all mean? I promise it goes somewhere. Remember, it's all about me today. Pretend like you're excited. Huh? Writing right here. <laughs> yep. Well, one thing that might help us is let's we could establish the literal level. Okay, so he does describe to us how the the line is kept, right? He says it's in a concentric circle. Well, all circles are concentric. 
Um, right? Yeah. Um, this he calls the heart, and we have the line around it spiraling around, okay? So if we have that visual in front of us, it helps us figure it out. But what does he compare all of this to? Cheese. Yes. So why <coughs> cheese? That came out of nowhere. All of a sudden, we got some cheese. Why the food comparison? Okay? And then we potentially have, why does he describe it as the heart? Right? Because that has a lot of connotations with it. Anything else that we noticed? Is he hungry? <laughs> Is he hungry? Write it down. It could be a good question. Wouldn't saying, like, wouldn't asking what, what's the significance of using heart, isn't that analysis kind of? No, we can just say why heart. Why does he describe it as a heart? Because that's figurative. It's not literally the heart, it's the center of the top. So you know it's going to go somewhere, but it's still okay to say why, why does he describe it as a heart. Okay? So that's our first picture at a line tub. Are you ready? Because we're about to compare it to another kind of line tub. Are you ready? I don't think you're ready, but I'm going to move forward anyway. In English boats, English boats, two tubs are used instead of one, the same line being continuously coiled in both tubs. There is some advantage in this because these twin tubs being so small, they fit more readily into the boat and do not strain it so much. Whereas the American tub, nearly three feet in diameter and of proportionate depth, makes a rather bulky freight for a craft whose planks are but one half inch in thickness. For the bottom of the whale boat is like critical ice which will bear up a considerable distributed weight, but not very much of a concentrated one. When the painted canvas cover is clapped on the American line tub, the boat looks as if it were pulling off with a prodigious great wedding cake to present to the whales. Just got exciting. Why did it get so exciting? Well, yeah, why all of a sudden, now we have the interjection of the English versus American, right? We, don't we all of a sudden want to start going, jumping into the analysis? I know I do, but we're not going to yet. What other things do we observe? The simile. What simile? The whale boat is like critical ice. Yeah, why, why, why is use of the simile, why does he say it's like critical ice? <coughs> why a wedding cake? Why a wedding cake? What is this whale, ex what is this going to have anything to do with the, the boat is going to do what to these whales? It's going to kill them, and yet they're comparing the line boat thing that is part of the mechanism of doing it as a great big wedding cake. So why a wedding cake? And what's that, more food imagery? What? He is definitely hungry. <laughs> That's analysis. We gotta ask the question. So why cake? All right. So, um, and not to mention which we only get a description of what the cover canvas looks like on the American one, not on the other one. Okay. But remember, so this is the American version, and the British version is two tons. All right. Both ends of the line are exposed. The lower end terminating in an eye splice or loop coming up from the bottom against the side of the tub and hanging over its edge completely disengaged from everything. This arrangement of the lower end is necessary on two accounts. First, in order to facilitate the fastening to it of an additional line with a neighboring boat, in case a stricken whale should sound so deep as to threaten to carry off the entire line originally attached to the harpoon. In these instances, the whale of course is shifted like a mug of ale, as it were, from the one boat to the other though the first boat always hovers at hand to assist its consort. Second, this arrangement is indispensable for common safety's sake, for were the lower end of the line in any way attached to the boat, and were the whale then to run the line out to the end almost in a single smoking minute, as he sometimes does, he would not stop there, for the doomed boat would infallibly be dragged down after him into the profundity of the sea, and in that case, no town crier would ever find her again. Just got real. We are now starting to see the danger of being on a whale boat, which is you're trying to drag a giant whale in. What do we see? Um, what questions? Why, why did he use the word consort and 
like, is it related to the wedding cake earlier? Yeah, I mean, why consort? Consort has a lot of connotations, right? Do you know what a consort is? No. It's like a... It's like a... a hmm, I'm trying to think of a... <laughs> it's a companion, um, but it usually means, like, a special kind of companion. You picking up what I'm putting down here? Do I have to? Okay, all right. No, not a wife. <laughs> but, like, you could have a wife and a consort. Okay. Or you could be not married and have a consort. So it has connotations. Okay? What else do we see? Yeah. Um, he refers, why does he refer to the whale as a Good, right. And good reframing it to a question. Why is the whale a male? We don't necessarily, obviously there are boy and girl whales. Why is the boat a girl? Why is the boat a girl? Okay, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if this is more analysis, but why is he changing tense? Why is he changing tense? No, that's not analysis. You're asking a question that could lead to it. Why a tense shift? Yes. Why is he using a simile to compare the whale to a mug of ale? Yes, and of course, I got... Your turn, your turn, Evan. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, is he hungry? Um, what's he eating? <laughs> <laughs> now, now he's drinking. We just talked about the mug of ale. Okay, well, now he's thirsty, too. Yeah, we're just smoking a minute. Yeah, why a smoking minute? A minute can't literally be smoking, right? Okay, we're asking, these are great questions. We're starting to see that, okay? All right. So I want to get to the good stuff. So we're going to keep moving forward, even though I know we could spend like 20 more minutes there asking excellent questions. Before lowering the boat for the chase, so now we're, in a, we're getting ready for a chase, the upper end of the line is taken aft from the tub and passing around the loggerhead there is again carried forward the entire length of the boat, resting crosswise upon the loom or handle of every man's oar so that it jogs against his wrist in rowing, and also passing between the men as they alternately sit at the opposite gunnels to the leaded chocks or grooves in the extreme pointed prow of the boat, where a wooden pin or skewer the size of a common quill prevents it from slipping out. From the chocks, it hangs in a slight festoon over the bows and is then passed inside the boat again in some 10 or 20 fathoms called box line. Being coiled upon the box in the bows, it continues its way to the gunwale still a little further aft and is then attached to the short wharf, the rope which is immediately connected with the harpoon but previous to that connection, the short wharf goes through sundry mystifications too tedious to detail. So all that, there's one thing that's too tedious to detail. All right, so find yourself. I'm going to start drawing an amazing picture of a boat up here. That does not look like a whale. <laughs> okay, that's why I put a question mark, okay, and cue the food imagery going. All right, what do we see here? What questions do we have? Are you trying to get a correlation between the author and the goldfish on the board? Are you trying? That's a, that's a leading question. Remember I said I would find one? That's not a real question. That's a statement hiding as a question, okay? But yes, now I want goldfish to answer your question. That didn't answer your question. But remember, just questions. Yeah. Did we find Nemo? Okay. Maybe about Moby Dick, because you know, this is about me today, remember? This is about me and how much I love this. Yes. Why does he say extreme pointed prow? Extreme pointed prow, okay? So, what's our device that we could be asking about there? Alliteration. Yeah, why the alliteration? Okay, yeah. Um, why does he refer to like magic again? He says myst or sundry mystifications. What? When he's discussing something, so like. And it's, rope, and it's rope, right? Okay, so why, again, the situational irony? Why, you know, all of those kinds of things that we have going on? Emma. Why did he spell connection with, like, an S? Okay, just a quick answer. That's how they used to spell it. Oh. Okay, so, fun fact. Yeah, so, yeah. It was this time period. I really don't know the whole story about it, but there's the other element of this, too, is, like, you could say, why tie it to the loggerhead? What's the significance of a loggerhead? Oh, isn't that but a we do, what? Isn't that a turtle? Well, it is a kind of a turtle, but it's also a part of a boat. But you have to understand, too, that 
Melville did have a lot of whaling experience, and so he knew the parts of the boat, and so a lot of this could just be literally true. That you have to have, because he talks about that pin that he has here to keep the whale, you know, they have the thing back here, this is the whale line tub, and then you have the rowing guys. I'm just going to write it instead of beginning to try and try it. Does that have a motor? <laughs> no. no. 1851. Oh, I didn't yeah. know what year it was. That's okay. Whale line. This is the pen with the rowing guys. And when we start to do the chase, right, it's wrapping it back, and they say it's like festoon. Okay? What's weird about the word festoon? It's sounds Yeah, that's like party time. Okay? It sounds okay? like a pontoon. <laughs> it sounds like a pontoon. Um, yes. And yeah, we have to have, why do we have to have our rowing guys? When? Normally, it's a sailboat. Why do we ever have to have anyone rowing on a whale boat? So, yeah. Once you catch it, you think it's just going to be like, oh, you caught me. I give up. Okay, no. He's going to fight you and might drag you down into the bottom of the, what was it? Profundity of the sea. Okay, and so, what? So, uh, we definitely uh, know that there's a risk here. Okay. All right, so we have festoon standing out. Any other things that we see that stand out here? My question would be, after all this information about rope, why is the short warp too, too sundry for us to go into too tedious of a detail? Have we not had a little bit of tedium in terms of the detail? So uh, my question would be, why is this too tedious? All right, you guys ready? It's about to get real. Are you ready? We have a whale, a farm. We have a whale. Thus, the whale line folds the boat in its complicated coils, twisting and writhing around in almost every direction. All the oarsmen are involved in its perilous contortions, so that to the timid eye of the landsmen, they seem as Indian jugglers with the deadliest snakes sportively festooning their limbs. Nor can any son of mortal woman for the first time seat himself amid these hemp and intricacies, and while straining his utmost at the oar, but think him that at any unknown instant the harpoon may be darted, and all these horrible contortions be put into play like ring lightnings. He cannot be thus circumstanced without a shudder that makes the very marrow and the bones to quiver in him like a shaken jelly. Yet habit, strange thing, what cannot habit accomplish? Gayer sallies, more merry mirth, better jokes, and better repartees you never heard over your mahogany than you will ever hear over the half-inch white cedar of the whale boat, when thus hung in hangsman nooses. And like the six burghers of Calais before King Edward, the six men composing the crew pull into the jaws of death with the halter around every neck, as you may say. Oh, my God. It's getting tense, right? Because now what do we see? What are some of the figurative things that we see here? What are some questions we're going to want to ask? Shake and jelly. What's the thing? Why shake and jelly? What? It's like we have a bunch of party food. Festooning, wedding cakes, What? Okay, what else? Yes? Why to the eye of the landsman? Why, why are we bringing the landsman in, right? Yeah. Two. I mean, isn't that our first inclusion <clears throat> of somebody from land? And we're getting that outside perspective of what it must be like? Yeah. Why does he keep using, like, Indian references? Yeah, why again the Indian reference? That's our second one. Great. Why words that sound like food? What does that sound like what? Words that sound like food. Yeah, again, Chicken why? Burgers. <laughs> okay, well, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, the one thing that is an illusion, I don't exactly know what a burger is, um, and I, maybe I'm saying it wrong, and it's like, and so that was my bad, but um, I definitely, our question would be by, why the six, whatever that word is, of Calais. He also mentions white Yes, absolutely. Why that? Yes. Why is he addressing the audience all of a sudden? He broke through that wall. Okay, what else? sentences are a lot different than structured than like the whole thing just being one long sentence it's like we have multiple talking. sentences yeah. in a paragraph for maybe the first time what okay and you can you can feel that you know I, I, I'm not wait I'm sorry I'm going to analysis I started to do a syntactical analysis I'm going to stop myself even though I really want to go there okay all right you know what I can't handle anymore I'm just going to finish this and I want you guys ready and annotating are you ready it's all coming together I'm like, I'm so excited for you guys. I'm not going to get cut off, am I? Better hurry. All right. 
Perhaps a very little thought will now enable you to account for those repeated whaling disasters, some few of which are casually chronicled of this man or that man being taken out of the boat by the line and lost. For when the line is darting out to be seated then in the boat, it's like being seated in the midst of the manifold whizzings of a steam engine in full play, where every flying beam and shaft and wheel is grazing you. It is worse, for you cannot sit motionless in the heart of these perils, because the boat is rocking like a cradle, and you are pitched one way and the other without the slightest warning, and only by the certain self-adjusting buoyancy and simultaneousness of volition and action can you escape being made a mazeppa of and run away where the all-seeing sun himself could never pierce you out. Again, as the profound calm which only apparently precedes and prophecies of the storm is perhaps more awful than the storm itself, for indeed the calm is but the wrapper and envelope of the storm and contains it in itself as the seemingly harmless rifle holds the fatal powder and the ball and the explosion. So the graceful repose of the line as it silently serpentines around the oarsmen before being brought into actual play this is the thing which carries more of true terror than any other aspect of the dangerous affair. But why say more? All men live enveloped in whale lines. All are born with halters round their necks. But it is only when caught in the swift, sudden turn of death that mortals realize the silent, subtle, ever-present perils of life. And if you be a philosopher, though seated in the whale boat, you would not at heart feel one whit more of terror than those seated before your evening fire with a poker and not a harpoon by your side. Holy cow. Did you just get chills? I did. Look, I'm not even kidding. Go back through there. There was a lot going on. Write down some questions. I want to see everybody write down at least one question. In order to be able to do that, guess what you have to have? My opinion, it's all about me today, you guys, so yes, uh, this is the, to me the greatest chapter in all of American literature, How many pages? so it's kind of hard to do that, it's big, it's like 800, 900 pages. It's, uh, it's good, but maybe we could have like a movie that book club. No, no, you guys are going to say yes right now, because you want to, but then later. Water. <laughs> it's 3D. <laughs> Alright, questions. How can you leave? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> she's sitting there thinking about that whale line around her neck and she's wondering what is it right now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Alright. It actually does make me want to go back and read it because I did not enjoy it nearly as much as I did this last 15 minutes. Uh, to what? Relationship. To relationship. Good. What else? Starting out with, I mean, like, a car. You're starting to want to put it all together. Hold on. But why the relationships? Yes. Can I ask you a real question? Yes. What's a, a Mazepa? Okay, it's a Mazepa, and I never remember, and I've looked it up 45 times. So our question would be, good question, Afam, why his allusion to Mazepa? And then in that, you would have to look that up and then consider it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Why is the call before the storm so well, our question would be, why then the repetition of calm before the storm? Okay, right? So if you frame it in the literary devices, you're going to be more likely to open yourself up to analysis than start driving it subconsciously. Yeah? Why the um, personification of the sun? Why the personification of the sun? Great, yeah. Um, why the extended introduction with like the descriptions that leads to a conclusion that it was more relevant? Okay, so instead of, there's a lot of judgment in that question. Um, how, is this to how is this structured? Where was the main idea? 
It's kind of like a sentence, right? How yeah. Ollie always loves the periodic sentences and you'll get the main idea. That's also inductive, right? It's an indu So why the inductive structure? Why not give you the stuff up front? Why, why not have you reading, thinking about this that way the entire time? Okay? Um, and I think answering that question is the heart of, you know, this. Um, hold on a second. I saw a hand over here. Someone had a question? Yeah. Yeah, why is it all men and not all mortals? Okay. Why all men and not all mortals? Yeah. Why does he use the word halter? Okay. Why they use halter? Okay. Instead of, you know, noose, noose why or... Why did he say rocking like a cradle? What is the baby? Right. Doesn't that seem out of place? So why rocking like a cradle? Because that does seem out of place, right? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Yeah. Uh, why does he uh, keep repeating like the will is like a mother or a mother -like? Okay. So why the maternal imagery, the maternal metaphors, those kinds of things? Um, so now that we're at the end here, we are now ready to answer some of these questions that we have. Okay. So now, the, one of the last images we have is of... Um, Oh, sorry. One of the last images that we have is of a guy sitting by a fire, poking the fire with a saying. And what is Herman Melville saying to him? What is he saying about that guy? He's in just as much danger, He's in just as, much danger as the guys on the whale boat. But what's the difference between the two? He got a harpoon and one is a poker. Well, right. No, there's certainly meant to be parallels between the harpoon and the um, poker. But what... Apparentness of the... Right, exactly. The people on the boat are, cannot ever forget how much danger they're in because that rope is constantly around them on their limbs. They're doing that. But when you're at home in your fire, you at your parties with your cheeses and your cakes and your ales and your jellies and all of those things, it, it can be really hard for us to remember, uh, you know, what's going on there. Okay? So, all of us have it, but the difference between us and people who are in constant danger is that we don't know it and we don't think about it. Okay? So, that's a lot of questions that we have here. And so to bring it all together, I have a little thing that's going to help us pull these ideas together. Okay? So it's going to be to consider some of the questions and implications. We've had so many things to talk about. We've got America versus England. Uh, we have all the food imagery. Uh, we had uh, the different types, the issue with the Indians and the racial issues. Um, you could go a lot of different ways with this. But at the end, if you could do this with a text, you're going to broaden out your potential for analysis so you don't get stuck analyzing something you really don't have that much to say anything about. And if you start thinking too early about what you want to analyze instead of just kind of letting it happen, you are going to limit to that initial reaction. And how much would you be missing in this chapter if you just stuck with the beginning? You'd be missing the whole point. Okay, and you can understand why someone who got to this chapter and didn't get to the end would be like, there, okay? But I want you to very seriously consider why would he take that risk then? Why structure it that way? Why, why like potentially alienate the people doing that, assuming that he did it on purpose? Okay, so I want you guys to start thinking about this and doing this and call me over if you have any questions. Okay?